So again, just an invitation to join us on an exciting journey through the Bible over the next 10 weeks. We're going to read First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. Who, who um, is, this is going to be the first time they're reading these four books of the Bible straight through? I'm sure it's probably at least half of us. Um, so these, are the, these four books of the Bible have got some of the most exciting stories in the whole Bible. The readings for each week are different in length. They're divided up based on story, not on a ratio. And so next week's readings, or the readings that you'd start today in preparation for next week's sermon, is the longest one. It's about 31 chapters. And so everybody say 31 chapters. That's a lot, isn't it? So it's like about four chapters a day. But I reckon that when you start reading it, you'll read it all in one hit because it is so interesting you're going to read about this little boy who was just a shepherd and he fought off a lion and a bear with the power of God. Then a few years rolled by and he went into battle and he killed a 10 foot tall giant. And you're going to hear many other stories that you don't know so well about that same boy as he grew up and continued to trust God. And so you're going to love it. <clears throat> Let's just have a show of hands who's, who's willing to go on this journey and read these four books of the Bible. Let's see church. You'll be blessed. You will be blessed. All right. Well, a special welcome to everybody who's watching us online. Are we on, Alan? So thank you for joining us. It's a real privilege that you're um, being a part of our church family today. Thanks for coming out, everybody, and being here. I really believe that God's got a special message to share with us today. Alan, you've got a little cursor arrow up on the screen. All right. This is a horrible picture really isn't it can you see that what you're looking at is a child with smallpox in 1973 who here remembers smallpox yeah I didn't know much about it because I was born in 1978 now watch about this we're going to learn about the power of inoculation today smallpox was an infectious disease that resulted in a rash and it would this poor little child's got that. Blisters that would kill between 1 and 35% of victims. There were two different types of strain. One was a 1% kill rate, and the other was a 30 to 35% kill rate. If you didn't die, you could get blindness from it. You could, lose, uh, you could lose use of your limbs and have scarring, obviously, after such a terrible rash. Smallpox virus has been around for about the length of human history. One of the um, mummies from Egypt that they've unearthed had some smallpox virus on them. And it killed about 400,000 people annually in Europe at the end of the 18th century per year. That's how many people are dying from this. And it was responsible for one third of all blindness. What a terrible disease. The World Health Organization estimated that just as recently as 1967, 15 million people had the disease and 2 million died from it in that year. That's terrible, isn't it? Back in 1967. And it was responsible for 300 to 500 million deaths during the last 100 years. That's terrible, isn't it? Well, here's the good news. Um, I'm missing a slide here and I'll just have to tell you what it says. In 1977... The World Health Organization announced that there's no more smallpox in the whole world. Let's hear a praise the Lord for that. It's, they, start, they did, between the 19th century and the 20th century, they started inoculating people. And by 1977, there was no one left with the virus in their body. Isn't that fantastic? That is a successful vaccination story. Now, here's how it works. An inoculation involves a deliberate introduction of the sickness to the person. Now, we know that this is the same idea of vaccines, right? So you get a little bit of the weak virus, you make the person sick with it, and our white blood cells go to work trying to destroy the virus. They're successful, and they keep a little memory bank, and they remember how to kill that virus, and so if it comes around, they're going to conquer it and not get sick. Does that make sense? And so this is what inoculations do. A, a, a gentle exposure builds up a strength against that sickness. And this is what happens. So 
That's how come that we live in an environment that is free from such a terrible disease. Did you know that it's the only disease in all the world um, that affects humanity that we've completely eradicated? That's interesting, isn't it? It's the only one. There's another disease that we've completely eradicated, but it's for cows. And so you can look it up on Wikipedia. Anyway, um, I want you to think spiritually now for a moment. Imagine if you could become inoculated against the power and the presence of God. Now, inoculations are normally a good thing, right? We're trying to stop ourselves from the effects of a bad force. But what if we inoculated ourselves against the power and the presence of God? How bad would that be if we became immune to the power and presence of God? And the idea of that is that we are exposed to the power and presence of God in some kind of dose, but we don't soften our hearts to God. Instead, we choose to harden our hearts to him, and then we keep getting repeated exposures again and again and again to the Holy Spirit, to God in our life. But as time goes by, as we continue to harden our hearts, it has no, his presence has no effect on us whatsoever. And the Bible talks about this as a phenomenon that happens. And today we're going to take our teaching from the books of 1 Samuel chapter 1 to 8. We're going to read about a family with a dad named Eli, who was the high priest, the leader of all of Israel. And he had become inoculated to the presence of God. This was the man who was supposed to be the spiritual leader for the whole nation. But through one weak decision after another... He became in such a place that he could be at the temple of God himself, where God's presence was supposed to manifest, and it had no real changing power on him. You know, he had two sons who who walked down the same path. Their names were Hophni and Phinehas. Everybody say, Hophni and Phinehas. And these sons, the Bible says, were wicked sons. And they grew up in the most, should have been the most, God-fearing family in the nation. But they were the wickedest boys in the nation. They had become immune to the power and the presence of God. And today we're going to contrast the lives of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas with another family. A mum named Hannah and a boy named Samuel. And Samuel and Hannah, they turned towards the Lord in a different way. And as Eli and Hophni and Phinehas dishonoured God and were, they eventually suffered the consequence of that. Uh, Samuel and his mum Hannah were lifted up and honoured as they honoured God. Let's pray together and ask for God's blessing. Dear Father in heaven, we want to thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is here with us. But I guess our prayer today is that you would save us from becoming inoculated against the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to have soft hearts when we have the opportunity to move closer to you. When you convict us of sin, help us to say, I'm sorry, Lord, and then change our lives, not just keep going back to it. So please help us today to learn from the scriptures that you've given us. I pray that you'd speak to each one of us with power in the way that we need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel, and we're going to be looking at a few stories here. 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at, we're going to start with chapter 2. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. And the priest's custom was to, um, whenever any man came to the temple to offer a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. He'd thrust it into the pan or kettle and take some of the meat. And this was the custom. And they also burned the fat there. And the priest's son would come and say to the man who was sacrificing something, for forgiveness of sin, give the meat for roasting to the priest, and he'll not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And if the man said to him, 
We should really burn the fat first. See, in Deuteronomy, God gave very specific instructions about how the sacrifice was to, to take place. And they were to never eat the fat. Some of the meat was to go to the priests to eat, and that's how they lived, because they weren't allowed to accumulate lands and cattle of their own. They were to live off the sacrifices of the rest of the land as they came for repentance. But one of the laws was cut off the fat. Well, Eli's boys, Hophni and Phinehas, would push them aside before they'd boiled the meat with the, with the fat still on it. And if anybody complained, look what it says. If the man said to him, oh, you should really burn the fat first, then take as much as your heart desires, he would say to them, no, you must give it to me now, and if not, I'll take it by force. Do you know what that's saying? They're saying, we'll get violent with you if you just don't give it to us right now. Who is saying this? This is the priests. Now, we just heard in the heart to heart about leadership. And this is the worst abuse of leadership that you could get. These people are supposed to be demonstrating what it is to be a godly leader. And they're making a mockery of the sacrifice system. And remember, you know, we're reading the Old Testament. And you might think, well, that doesn't have Jesus in it. Well, think again. The Old Testament is filled with arrows pointing to Jesus. The sacrifice was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. In a sense, these boys, as they mocked the, the animal sacrifice, they were mocking Jesus himself. They were making a mockery of the sacrifice that was to come, Jesus Christ. How could they get to this point? I want to talk about parenting for a moment. Eli was their dad. And the Bible describes Eli, if you you, as you read those chapters, as a kind-hearted but weak man. And um, he had a soft heart, but he didn't have what it took to discipline his kids the way they needed to be disciplined. And so what ended up happening was that his boys just carried on and carried on, and he would have had this attitude, oh, they're too young now, I'll discipline them when they get a bit later and they can understand. But by the time a bit later came around, the boys were already set in their ways. And parents, we've got a work to do, especially when our children are young. By the time they're in their late teens, it's too late. And if you think about it, you know, this is how Parenting Toolbox describes good parenting. It says, imagine a triangle. And so this is triangle demonstrates the freedom that mums and dads should give to their children. And when they're young, there's not much freedom. It's very narrow end of the triangle. Mum and dad tell the kids everything, what to do, what's right and wrong. And so they should. And then as the child gets older and older, the options open up wider and wider. And so I encourage parents to, you know, you've really got to be the boss and tell those children at least 12 years of age. And then as they get into the teen years, then you've got to broaden it out more and more. You know, sometimes I hear parents say, oh, I'll let my children decide for themselves whether or not they should learn about God or come to church. And this is parents with children who are six, eight years of age or something like that. And I just think in my heart, that is a big mistake. You know, if they are a believer already, uh, you know, I'll get alongside of them and I'll encourage them to make the right choice there. Because... Why would we do that? That principle hasn't come from God or the Bible. That's come from our culture. And non-Christians say stuff like that. But as a believer, you know God is real. And you've got to do everything you can to encourage your child to come close to God and to take full responsibility for that little one when they're young. When they're a teenager, you're going to give them more and more freedom to make their own choice. But while they're under your own roof, and you know, until they're 18 or whatever, you're responsible for their life and... You can't make their choices for them, but you can certainly be a strong guide to them as they, as they become an independent person. And it is, it's not easy, is it? It's a, it's a dance back and forth. But we've got to put in the energy, and that's what Eli failed to do. So by the time his sons were young men, he had no control over them whatsoever because he, was, he loved ease too much, he loved peace too much, he didn't want the confrontation. And, you know, I guess most parents have come to the point where they've made that decision. I don't care whether the child does a tantrum in the supermarket or not. I'm going to be the boss. And we've all sort of had to humble ourselves and realize that, you know, this child will do his best to try and make a fool of me. They understand what they're doing and everything like that. But they're not going to get their way. And um, if, somebody, if somebody gives me a funny look or whatever, that's too bad. Because my responsibility is to teach this child good behavior, and in particular, to grow them up in the way of the Lord. 
And there's tough moments, aren't there, parents? There's plenty of tough moments. And we need help from heaven. And we're going to contrast this story in a moment with another story. Well, I'll do it right now. There was another boy who grew up and answered a prayer boy. And his name was Samuel. And so have a look with me in, back in chapter 1. And it says, so there were, in verse 1 it says, There was a certain man of Ramathaim, of Zophim, in the mountains of Ephraim. And his name was Elkanah. And he had two wives. One was Hannah and the other was Penaniah. Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And every year they'd go and worship at the temple. And when they got there, he would give a gift of extra food to his wife, because Hannah, because she had no child. And Penaniah was a woman who was, she had a wicked heart, really. And she would mock the other wife and give her a real hard time about the fact that she had no children. And Hannah couldn't handle it anymore. And she was always on her back about it. And then in verse 9, you read, Hannah rose after they'd finished eating and drinking, and Eli the priest... Um, oh, we'll read verse 7. And so it was year by year that when she went up to the house of the Lord, she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. That's Hannah. Elkanah said to her husband, Hannah, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Hannah arose after they'd finished eating and drinking, and Eli the priest was sitting by the seat at the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And then she made a vow to the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, if you'll indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget me, but will give your male, me a male child, then I'll give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor will come upon his head. And as it happened, she continued praying. Eli watched her mouth. Hannah spoke in her heart and only her lips moved and her voice wasn't heard. And so Eli thought she was drunk. Verse 14. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put away your alcohol from you. But Hannah answered her, No, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm a woman with a sorrowful spirit. I've drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but I've poured out my heart to the Lord. Don't think of me as a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I've spoken. And Eli answered her, Go in peace, and the God of Israel, may he grant what you ask for. Wow. What an incredible moment that we've been given the privilege of looking into the life of somebody at their most broken point. And so here's Hannah, and here's my word of encouragement to you today. If you've got a dream in your heart, a longing, a God-given dream, take it to the Lord and pour it out before him. She only got the miracle when she wept before the Lord. And had she wanted a baby before then? You bet she did. But here she just brought her brokenness to God. And friends, some of us have got brokenness, maybe over sickness, maybe over a marriage situation, maybe it's a dream for um, creating something with your life. Maybe it's for your children or your grandchildren and you're broken over the direction that they're taking in life. Bring your brokenness to Jesus, friends. He's wanting to do a miracle in your life today. Um, don't keep it to yourself. Don't say to yourself, God already knows about it. You've got to t bring it to him with the belief that he's hearing you and you'll see him move in your life. And the Bible says that a year later she was blessed with this boy Samuel. Now Hannah's approach was different. She looked after him until he was a little boy and then brought him to the temple. And I believe that Hannah took that little boy aside every day because she promised to dedicate him to the Lord. And as soon as his little brain could start taking information, she started to teach him to fear and love the Lord. And, you know, there's something powerful about a child's brain between naught and 12. It's a window of opportunity. And we need to see our own children and do everything we can to draw them near to the Lord. But friends... Sometimes as parents, we think this is the most unglamorous job. You know, you just sit down and then you hear someone scream from the bathroom, come and help me on the toilet. And then you get up and, and then the other one. And then and on and on it goes. And you think, you know, this is, where's the prestige in this? Wiping bottoms all day. And, um, but, you know, it's a privilege to be a parent. The Bible says that to have, a, to have children is a gift from God. And it's a huge responsibility. And we, mums and dads, we should view this responsibility as one of the most greatest responsibilities and works of our whole life. 
And you might be the principal of a school or the um, owner of a business or whatever, but looking after your children and bringing them up to follow Jesus is the grandest of job descriptions that God gives out. And we all, um, you know, most of us at some point in our life will have the opportunity to, ha- to feed into the lives of our own children. And friends, if you are not with your own children, there are many children who need someone who loves them, who will put some good strength into their life, who will introduce them to Jesus. And there are so many grandmothers who are responsible for a grandson and a granddaughter coming to the Lord because somehow mum and dad are not doing it. But grandma's praying, praying, praying every time the kids come over, out with the Bible story books, listen to this children and filling their little minds with the goodness of God. And we've got to take every opportunity we can to take those under our care and lead them up in the way of the Lord. Doing the easy and fun moments, for sure, but also doing the tough moments. But let's not become sergeant majors and um, beat up our kids with it. That's not the answer. There's so many kids who have been turned away from religion by an overly strict mum or dad who have made it obnoxious to the child. And so it's, we need to be loving and firm and encouraging and like a coach to our younger ones, getting alongside of them, showing them what's right. But here's the thing, church family. We can't show them anything unless we know Jesus ourselves. Amen? You can't give them what you don't already have on your own. You've got to have your own connection with Jesus. And today, if that's where you're at, pray, God, refresh my heart, refresh my heart, and he will. That's what you've come here today for. You know, at the end, I'm going to give you an invitation to ask God to refresh your heart. Start listening to how God wants to work on your heart right now. Let's go back to Eli and Hophni and Phinehas. It got so bad, you know, Hophni and Phinehas were, the Bible says, this is, a, this is a going beyond uh, G rating here, and it says in chapter 2 and verse, um, verse 21, we'll pick it up. Uh, verse, verse 22, it says, Eli was very old, and he heard the things his son did to all Israel, how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. They were making an absolute mockery of the thing of God, a total disgrace. And so he said to them, so so Eli knows the wickedness of his sons and he rebukes them, but only too gently and it has no effect on them. He says, why do you do such things? For I hear of the evil dealings from all the people. No, my sons, it's not good. a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. See, here's the problem. This is where leadership had turned bad. Not only were they being naughty, wicked boys, but they, made, they led the whole of Israel into wickedness. Israel became a shambles at the time because the leadership was not God-fearing. And so um, it says there in verse 26, Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. They'd got it to the point where God thought the only outcome for these boys is to wipe them out. This is about as serious as it gets. And um, on, on the other hand, verse 26, the child Samuel grew in stature and favor with both the Lord and men. And we get this principle at work here. Um, what happened next was a prophet visited Eli. Now, Eli should have been the prophet to the rest of the nation, but God had to send a prophet to him. And this prophet comes to him and he says in 1 Samuel 2.29, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I've commanded in my dwelling place, and you honour your sons more than me? You honour your sons more than me. And then he says in verse 30, For those who honour me, I will honour, but those who despise me, uh, those who despise me shall be disdained. God is talking about an eternal principle here. If you honour God with your life, he's going to lift you up and establish you. And if you dishonour God, you're going to be released from the blessing of God and life is going to crash. And this happens in all of our lives. And so today I want to, it's a challenging word from the scripture today. And I want to invite you to search your heart and I want, to ask you, I want to invite you to ask yourself this question. Have I been inoculating myself 
to the Spirit of God in any area because I don't want to end up like Eli and his boys. Because what happened was Eli was in the temple of God. He should have been, he was able to be that close to the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God was supposed to appear. And yet he had soft, he had told the Holy Spirit and his conscience to, conscience to be quiet so many times that he was too weak to carry out what he knew to be right. And so have a look here. He, get, he gets this rebuke from the, from the prophet, and he says, verse 31, Behold, the days are coming when I'll cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, and there won't be an old man in your house. And he says in verse 34, Now here's a sign that'll come to you. Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they'll both die. And here's the sad news. Eli heard that, but he didn't change. He just kept trucking along. And we find that this is the pattern with people who inoculate themselves against God. They hear the word, they say, you're right, I've done wrong, I'm sorry. But then they carry on just the way they were before. And this is, can happen to us, friends. You know it's true, that you can come to church Sabbath after Sabbath, and it kind of settles down your conscience that's been pricking you all week and you feel good because you made an appearance and or maybe you read some scripture or said some prayers and your your burning conscience was kind of quietened and then you just carry on doing the same thing that you're doing before and this is a temptation that comes to leaders as well that you'll have one little area in your life where you it's your like pet thing and you let maybe it's a bad temper maybe it's looking at um you know, inappropriate things on the internet. Maybe it's an addiction that you keep promising that you're going to give up, but that you just never do. And you have a prayer and you say, I'm sorry, but there's no real intention to do anything about it. And if Eli had taken the bull by the horns, he would have confronted his boys, Hophni and Phinehas, after this message. He would have sacked them. And if he was following the example of the laws of the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, the Mosaic laws, he would have had his boys killed for, their, for the way they had led Israel into sin. And, be, you know, that's because they were leaders. And there's a harsher judgment upon them. But he did nothing. And God sent another warning to him. Now, let me just comment there on judgment warnings in the Bible. God gives a judgment warning, not just to say, get ready, brace yourself for the smack, here it comes. He sends the judgment warning so we will repent and avoid the judgment. Remember he sent um, Jonah to Nineveh, and when Jonah arrived, they repented, and God didn't wipe the Ninevites out because they repented. And that's what God desires to do after every judgment warning. And as you read First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, you will encounter wicked people who, when they heard that judgment was coming, they truly repented. And they didn't just say sorry, but they turned around, stopped their wicked ways, and started doing what God wanted them to do. And God did not judge them. That is the grace of God. Because you'd say to yourself, well, didn't they still do all that wicked stuff? Well, that's where Jesus comes in. He says, I'll take the heat from all the wickedness. Some for justice's sake, there has to be sacrifice. Something's got to pay the price. I'll pay it. I'm willing to forgive you. But he can't forgive you if you're not sincere in your repentance. And so we find that God speaks to Eli again. And at this stage, Samuel, the little boy who was brought up by his mum, Hannah, to follow Jesus is now a little helper in the temple. Maybe scholars believe he was about 12 years old when this event took place. Samuel's sleeping in one room in the temple, Eli's in the next room in the temple, an old man, a soft heart, kind to people, but not prepared to stand up and say no to sin in his own life and take responsibility as a, as a spiritual leader. And so what ends up happening is Samuel hears this voice, Samuel, Samuel, and we do it with our kids, we say. We read them the Bible story, and Pop always puts his hand over, Samuel. Samuel, <laughs> and because we know the Bible teaches us that God called out to Samuel in the night. Samuel didn't know God's voice in that way at that time. And he goes into Eli and says, here I am, what did you want? And Eli says, I didn't call you, go back to bed. It happens three times, Samuel, Samuel. And then in he goes, 
And then Eli, on the third time, Eli goes, I know what's going on. God is talking to you. Next time, say this. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so imagine it, this little boy in there thinking, God is going to talk to me. And he's waiting, and he doesn't have to wait long. And he hears this voice, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel says, speak, your servant is listening. And God gives him this message, and it is a message of judgment against Eli and his sons. And in the morning, he's probably scared witless. Who knows how much sleep he had that night? Because his master that he's been serving all these years has been told that he's going to die and his boys are going to die. And Eli knows already that the message is a message of judgment for him. And he threatens the boy and he says, may God do everything to you that you heard in the message if you don't tell me what the message was. And Samuel gave him the whole message. And do you know how Eli replied? Eli, let's have a look at it. It's 1 Samuel chapter 3, the end of it. Verse 16, And Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. And he said, What's the word the Lord spoke to you? Please don't hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me for all the things that he said to you. Verse 18, Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And, he, and, he, and then Samuel says, It is the Lord. Let him do what, he seem, what seems good to him. And the Bible says, So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. Do you know what happened? Did you hear that? Eli's answer, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. Some of us are familiar with this moment. We're feeling guilty and we know we deserve punishment. And so we say we're sorry. But that's not true repentance. If he was truly repentant, he would have ripped his clothes and, and um, t changed the behavior of what's going on. But he continued on the same as before. And he was doing the work of God, but he wasn't with God. Do you understand, church? Is it possible that we can come along to church and look good on the outside and do all these godly things, but be rejecting God where he's speaking to us that we need to let go of sin in our lives? And so, you know, maybe, we, maybe we're struggling with drugs or alcohol or smoking. We say, I'm sorry, and we have a prayer, Lord, help me give it up. And then we think to ourselves, Someone suggests that we empty out the fridge of all the beer or chuck out all the drugs or get rid of the cigarettes. And we think, no, I don't want to actually do that. Um, I'll just finish this lot before, and then I'll quit after that. Or maybe um, we've, we've screamed at the kids in anger again, and, or our spouse, and as a husband, we've been abusive, maybe not with our fists, but with our words, and we're destroying the family with our temper and we we apologize and we buy a bunch of roses and we take all the kids out and buy them some gifts because we truly feel bad about it we know it's rotten but then we don't do anything else we just think well i hope it changes somebody suggested go to see a counselor read some books about it but we don't bother doing anything we just carry on hoping the problem will go away maybe you're like me and you say I'm going to get up early and spend some time with God. And if you're like me, you know it's the very best thing that you could do for your relationship with God. But it gets to 9.30 the night before, and you feel like you haven't had enough fun yet. And you know that when, if you wake up tomorrow, the fun's all over, and it's work, work, work till the evening, and you haven't had enough fun that evening. And so you stay up to 11.30 or 12, watching a movie or something like that, and then your alarm rings at 6 a.m. when you were going to spend that half an hour or so with God, but you just think, oh, I'm so tired, I'll just turn it off today. And you know this pattern again and again and again, but then when the day comes around and it's 9.30 at night, you do it all over again, and there's no real change year in, year out. And the years roll by, and you, you're... Your time with God is always just five minutes of a quick prayer before you rush out the door. And you know, if you're to be honest, God is calling you to spend real time with him. And you tell people, yes, I put God first place in my life, but where's the evidence of that? Are you really? 
Or are you putting, and this is, I'm speaking to myself here, this is a revelation I've had over the last couple of months. Or am I really putting a relaxing time as first place in my life? That, I, that, that, that time of just unwinding and relaxing is more precious to me than making sure that I draw near to God in the morning before my busy day starts. And lately I've had to get honest with myself about that and realise I'm just making excuses. I'm 35 years old now, halfway through my three score and ten, and I'm still not spending proper time with God faithfully. It happens in spurts here and there and here and there. It'll be good for maybe months in a row, but then time will just roll off and, and then I'll go into a bad habit for months in a row. Where's the consistency? Where, and it's just reflecting that I'm talking the talk but I'm not really following it through. And my, my greatest concern is that we would inoculate ourselves against the Holy Spirit, doing little things to pacify his voice, being close to him. Eli would have been a kind guy. If you're in trouble, you know, he, he rebuked Hannah for drink, being a drunkard. When he found out was wrong, he was kind to her. He wanted good things for her, but he wasn't prepared to make a big move in his life to get things right. And for some of us, let's be honest, the thing that God's tapping us on the shoulder about right now would require a really big move. Maybe we're involved in a relationship with someone, sleeping with someone, and we know it's wrong, and we just can't bear to end the relationship or to put it right in God's way. Maybe, um, maybe the, the job that you're involved in you know is unethical and it, would, and it conflicts with some of God's principles. Maybe it's work on Sabbath or maybe it's dishonest in some way. And you, just know, and you know that if you're going to line up your life with the Lord, you're going to have to sell your house, do something really big. Because that's what it got to with Eli. It got to the point where if he was going to redeem his own heart and his own walk with the Lord, he was going to have to do something really big in rebuking his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And he was not prepared to go through with the humiliation, the shame, the confrontation, the difficulty, and the heartbreak of re rebuking and disciplining his sons at that magnitude. And because he didn't, the Bible tells us that Eli and his sons, they befell the judgment that God had for them. The boys were killed in battle. They went out into battle without God's leadership. They didn't consult him or anything like that. And by the way, you're going to discover a lot of battles in the four books of the Bible that you're about to read. And when God sends them into battle, they win in the most bizarre ways. And it's really just a miracle. God obliterates the enemies. But these guys waltz off into battle, none of the blessing of God, and they were both killed. When Eli hears the news, he, was, he didn't even get too upset when he heard his sons had died, but they had dragged the Ark of the Covenant as a magic trick box into the battle and the enemy the philistines had taken the ark of god captive and when eli heard that the bible says that he fell backwards on his seat and broke his neck and died terrible he knew and then and the bible says these words that one of hophni and phineas's wives had a child and they named that child the glory has departed from israel god's presence has left now here's the great news a few years went by and Samuel stepped up into leadership and he spoke to the people. Well, he stepped up straight after that. He, and you can see it there in the scripture, chapter 7, and it says, Then Samuel spoke to the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, how much of your heart? With all your heart. And then put away the foreign gods and Ashtoreths from among you. And for us, you fill in the blank what the thing is that you are allowing to continue on in your life that you know shouldn't be there. Whether it's an addiction, a bad habit, not neglecting the service that God's requiring of you, whatever it is. And you prepare your hearts before the Lord and you serve him only. He will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. And then if you read the rest of that chapter, an amazing thing happens. Because all of Israel gathered for this special ceremony of repentance, at that time, the Philistines said, look, those Hebrews are amassing. It must be an army. Let's attack them. 
and they get word, Samuel gets word, the Philistines are here. These guys have come for spiritual repentance. They are not prepared for war. And the people repented and they cried out to God for help. That's what Eli should have done when he got in trouble, but he never did. And they cried out to God. They humbled themselves before God, cried out for help. And if you're struggling with sin, don't just say, I'm sorry, and then keep doing it. Cry out to God for help and then see some change in your life. And they cried out to the Lord. And the Bible says God came in the form of a storm and defeated the Philistine army. And then they grabbed their swords and went off and wiped out a few more. And it was a total victory. And the Bible says that Philistine army never bothered them again all the time that Samuel, for the rest of his whole life, that he was the judge. What is that? They honored God and God honored them. Samuel honored God and he was established by God. Eli dishonored God and not only he and his child, but the whole nation under his time suffered more and more and more. Friends, how does the devil get somebody who's church going to derail their faith? Well, he does it in a way that you think that your faith is not even derailed. You think that everything's okay. And the Bible says in 1 Timothy that in the last days there's going to be all kinds of wickedness on earth and it describes all these terrible things. And the last phrase in the wickedness of the last days is they'll have a form of godliness but deny its power. Everybody say that. Form of godliness but deny its power. So there's going to be a church in the last days that looks like God's church. They're going to do all the churchy things, pray, read the Bible, sing songs, give money. But there's going to be real no power and presence of God. And there will be, that'll be, there'll be individuals like that. There'll be whole church groups like that. And so we've got to make a decision, friends, at Garden City Fellowship, that we are not going to inoculate ourselves against the power and presence of God, but we're going to cry out for the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit's power and presence. And church, we've got to be prepared for change. Some of us, it means giving up rubbish that we know all too well. For some of us, it means engaging our lives. And we don't do any of these obvious wrong things, but we're just not really engaged with God. We're treating him as a side pet on the side so our conscience doesn't give us grief. And so God is calling us to engage with him fully and to be led by his Holy Spirit and to experience the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through our group. And we don't need a million people. We don't need a thousand. If we're a little group like this, but filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, mighty things are going to happen through this church community. And we need to, I believe, as a community, have a season of repentance and say to God, God, we have been playing around and almost inoculating ourselves against the power and presence of God. And, you know, I'm not saying that this is for everyone. Maybe your vit vitality in your spiritual life is going 100%. Well, praise the Lord. And you'll be happy to hear me preaching this because you'll be thinking, amen, that's right, we need to. When you're close to God, you're never... You're never upset by the idea of drawing even closer. And so, um, friends, let's, let's humble ourselves before God as a church community and say, God, we're sorry. Please come and touch us with your presence that's really going to change things. And with the Holy Spirit leading us and empowering us, we, we're going to end up in uncomfortable situations where we're going to have to have our faith tested. But at the end of the day, God will lift us up and establish us as we honor him. So I want to have a time of prayer right now. If you're watching at home or online, um, be a part of this prayer as well. In the prayer, I'm going to ask for repentance of sin and a breakthrough, but real change following it. Not just another day at church where we say, oh, I'm glad I said sorry about that and carry on doing what we we're doing, but real change. And also an empowerment for all of us that we wouldn't be these ones have a form of godliness, but with no power. But that as the Sabbaths roll by, one week at a time, we experience more and more and more power. When we get up and praise, that people will have prophetic thoughts come into their mind, that people would be healed even just from singing a song with the presence of God so close. And that when the preaching happens, that lives would really change, not just pattering along, doing the same thing year in, year out, but transformation will take place. Some people aren't going to like it, some people it's going to be the freedom and the gift that they've been longing for. Will you pray with me? Let's stand up on our feet.
During the prayer, I'm going to have those two parts to the prayer, and I'm going to invite you to raise your hand. So everybody close your eyes, bow your heads. This is not time for looking around at what anybody else is doing. This is just between you and God. But don't harden your heart to him today. Soften your heart and let him take first place truly in your life. Let's pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, you've heard the message today. You've given it to us, I believe. So Lord, we are sorry for our sin. And we don't want to just say sorry like Eli and then carry on doing the wrong thing. We want a real change. And if that's you and you know you need a real change, lift up your hand right now and say, yes, God, help me to put you first seriously in my life. And help me to not just say sorry today, but help me to carry it through, whether it's a a bad attitude or um, neglecting time with God or an addiction that we keep coming back to or some other personal private thing that we struggle with. Just lift up your hand right now and say, yes, God, I want to draw a line in the sand today. I'm not going to do an Eli. I'm going to be like Samuel and fully devote myself to you, cry out to you and make the change in my life with your power at, as my help. So raise your hand. I believe there's somebody else who Holy Spirit is just touching your heart right now saying, pick up your hand. You know that you, God wants you to be closer. Don't resist, friend. Lift up your hand right now and say, yes, God, I'm going to humble myself before you. I don't care what, it's not about what anybody else thinks. I'm going to draw near to you, God. I know that you're the only way. Just want to give you another opportunity. Just lift up that hand. All right. And you can put your hands down now. Now, second part of the prayer. Father, some of us, and me included, I know that I could engage with you more, Lord. And um, I'm praying for our church community. Sorry for where we've been kind of lukewarm and where we've been busy with other things in life. The worries of the world and the busyness of life and money and all this sort of stuff. And we've put you at a sort of a second place. We might have said that you're first, but really our actions show that you're second place. If you are ready to engage with God more and you're prepared to go where his spirit leads and you want more of the Holy Spirit for yourself and our church family, just raise your hand right now. Just say, yes, God, pour out your Holy Spirit, touch and change my life, use me, be my guide, transform me, and also come upon our church, Garden City Hornby, Aranui Tongan, our conference, fill our meeting places with the power and the presence of God and go with us as we go out in ones and twos to share the gospel. Just lift up your hand if you want more of the Spirit's power right now. Thank you, God. And you can put your hands down. Father, we just claim your Bible promise that says when we ask for your Holy Spirit, you give without finding fault. We also need wisdom to guide us as your Spirit empowers us. Some pretty amazing things can happen. And I pray for your wisdom to accompany this greater gifting of power I believe you've just poured out today. And so give us this wisdom, give us this power. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we're going to worship God together right now. Invite our singers to come on up.